All right. Once again, good morning, everyone. And I'm Tomasz Zolenski, and I'm a product manager at RF Elements and marketing manager at the same time. And my promise for for today to you is that you will learn uh, what beam efficiency is and why do we actually think it's the most important antenna parameter in WISP networks, as well as um, you will also learn about the other antenna parameters that are usually thought or known for um, you know, showing the the ability of an antenna to deal with noise. So let's let's start. So the parameters um, that are usually considered relevant when when speaking of the ability of an antenna to mitigate uh, the interference are front to back ratio, side load levels, or Etsy masks. And these you most likely know or at least heard about. And the one we at RF Elements believe is the most important one in terms of noise suppression is beam efficiency. Beam efficiency is the ratio of the main lobe energy to the total energy an antenna radiates. Now it says how much of the total signal energy is contained in the main lobe. As simple as that. So the maximum beam efficiency value is 100%, which is an ideal situation. That's really the ideal goal we desire. And the smaller the beam efficiency is, the more side lobes an antenna has. Since antenna side lobes are the direct cause of problems in WISD networks, antennas with a lot of side lobes should be avoided at all costs, really. The higher the beam efficiency of the antenna you use is, the better for your network and the end users of your services in the end. Beam efficiency is an antenna parameter not only to know about, but actually also factor it in when you're deciding on how to deal with the interference issues you may have in your, in your unlicensed networks. Now here is a practical example. So this is the radiation pattern of a generic parabolic dish. And if its beam efficiency is 40%, the remaining 60% of the energy goes everywhere else. In other words, side lobes. And because any radiation outside the main lobe is a side lobe, well, obviously it must go in the side lobes. And note that all the side lobes are highlighted here. So beam efficiency includes all the side lobes an antenna has. And if you want to compare two antennas in terms of side lobe performance, beam efficiency makes it extremely simple. The higher number wins. In this example, the ultra horn on the left has beam efficiency 99%, so only 1% short of perfection. A generic dish antenna, on the other hand, has beam efficiency 40%, so the remaining 60% of the energy it radiates is in the side lobes. 99% is clearly more than 40%, and that's why ultra horn is way better antenna in terms of noise suppression. In our opinion, the best on the market, to be honest. But to be fair, let's also have a look at the parameters you may already know. front to back ratio is, uh, is one of them and many manufacturers include it in their data sheets. So let's have a small recap of front to back ratio. The conventional thinking about front to back ratio is that if front to back ratio is high, it means an antenna is good for dense collocation. So if the antennas are back to back and both have high front to back ratio, they will not interfere with each other. The reality is that high front to back ratio does not mean that antenna is good for dense collocation in every possible setting. It is simply a misunderstanding. It's important to really get this right. Because the next time you have a conversation about front-to-back ratio, you can be sure that if anyone is saying that high front-to-back ratio means an antenna is great for collocation, you know that the person is either misinformed or simply didn't go deep enough with the topic. High front-to-back ratio means that the backlobe is small. 
This is the lobe pointing in the opposite direction as the main lobe. It can also mean that the group of side lobes around the back lobe is small, depending on the definition or the way the front to back ratio was determined. The front to back ratio is very easy to understand. Um, looking at the radiation pattern of an antenna in this example, we show the, the pattern of a directional patch array. The front to back ratio is the difference between the gain of the main lobe and the gain of the back lobe, which is pointing backwards. In practice, front to back ratio is often determined based on the strongest side lobe from a plus minus 30 degree angle around the back lobe because of possible manufacturing, assembly or material imperfections. And because of these imperfections, the back lobe might not just be a single lobe, but can be divided and fractured into several minor lobes around that direction. Nevertheless, back lobe is one of many side lobes antennas used in WISP industry typically have. So if backlobe is one out of many side lobes, then it's probably not so important. This is the typical error in interpretation of front to back ratio. It doesn't say anything about all the other side lobes. When two antennas are exactly back to back, which let's be honest, it's quite a rare kind of scenario, high front to back ratio can help to decrease the interference level the radio C. But as I said before, typical antenna used in WIST networks has a lot of side lobes, and the back lobe itself can be quite complex at the same time. As soon as there are more lengths on a tower or in the or collocated antennas are not exactly back to back, you are looking at noise issues coming your way because of all the other side loads that these antennas have. High front to back ratio provides absolutely no protection in high noise environment. So for urban and suburban areas with other wireless links in the neighborhood or even on the same tower, front to back ratio is irrelevant. These other links may be yours or competitors. Either way, they're using very similar hardware to yours, meaning their antennas most likely also have many side loads that create noise, receive the noise and anything in between through the rest of the side loads. Another parameter I want to mention is side lobe level. In practical life, its effect is similar to that of the front to back ratio. Yeah, so let's have a look at uh, the details of that. Side lobe level is the difference between the gain of the strongest side lobe and the main lobe. It is more useful than front to back ratio because uh, it at least points out the strongest side lobe, which says a bit about antenna performance in high noise areas, but just a little bit really. If side lobe level is high, the strongest side lobe is close to having the gain of the main lobe, making it a very poor antenna for WISP networks. The issue with side lobe level is that it does not talk about all the side lobes an antenna has. Again, side lobe level is defined by the strongest side lobe, which again is only one side lobe out of many and defined at a single frequency as well. Since the side lobes are changing with frequency, the noise level also changes with them. So despite you know what the strongest side lobe is at a single frequency, it is not very useful in the bigger picture, since simply switching the channel, everything changes. Side lobe level is therefore a very similar metric to front to back ratio. It tells you what the strongest side lobe is at one frequency, but nothing about the rest of the side lobes throughout the useful bandwidth of an antenna, which is the biggest issue with these metrics. In WISP networks, all side lobes of an antenna matter. So to sum it up, not all antenna parameters are practically useful for WISP networks. It simply depends on the context an antenna is used in. In the end, it is up to the users and actually mainly the manufacturers to responsibly look at each antenna, each antenna parameter and 
and evaluate, honestly evaluate whether it is useful in the framework of WIST networks or not. The conclusion for front to back ratio and side lobe level clearly says that these two are really not so important. They tell a very limited part of the story of the side lobes. And if you're wondering why WISP antenna manufacturers use them uh, and show them in their in their data sheets and on, my guess would be it's it's simply a remnant of the times when these parameters were the only ones that were easy to determine and calculate without enough computational power. Yeah. You may also know about the Etsy masks, which to a degree also serve as a parameter that says how well antennas perform in terms of noise. So yeah, let's have a look at those. It is important to clarify that Etsy masks consider two main cuts of antenna radiation pattern, the azimuth and elevation. They consider two slices of the 3D radiation pattern. So again, rather incomplete, like completely incomplete, <laughs> so to say, measure from the point of view of the whole 3D radiation pattern and all the side lobes that matter in WISP networks. Etsy masks are observed at three frequency points. So an improvement, right? So the beginning, the middle and the end of the spectrum an antenna works in. Nevertheless, the rest of the spectrum, which is rather wide in the case of WISP networks, is not included in Etsy masks definition. So again, not very robust measure. So how does one get to the Etsy masks and how do they look like? Starting with the polar plot, you may know from the antenna data sheets, redrawing it uh, and redrawing it on an XY axis or XY plot. Etsy masks uh, are the blue dashed line, yeah, which says that the radiation pattern should stay below the mask so that an antenna can be declared compliant with a given Etsy norm. If the radiation pattern does, does not stay below the mask, the antenna is not compliant, yeah, which is the case for, for this example. The masks are easy to understand and they're, to their credit, they do consider the whole 360 degree circle of a radiation pattern, but unfortunately only two cuts of the whole 3D radiation pattern at three frequency points of the whole spectrum an antenna may work in. So vast majority of the spectrum and the radiation pattern is simply not included. Which is why in terms of interference suppression in WISP networks, even these Etsy masks are really not that much of a, of a useful parameter. So whenever you see an antenna being compliant with a, a particular Etsy norm, know that it does not really bring much added value in terms of noise suppression in WISP networks. At our development, as, as a company, we are convinced uh, about doing the right thing for the customer and the industry at the same time. So we investigated the textbooks ourselves and found about beam efficiency, which is the most complete measure of side lobes out there if, if it's used well. And when I say the most complete, I'm not just you know using empty overstatements or simplifications. And by the time we're done with the, with the following slides, I, I promise you will understand why. So beam efficiency is the answer to the question of side lobes. So despite you might have never heard about beam efficiency before, at our development we do what we believe is the best for the customer, even if it means bringing something not considered or established before, and which might be which might be different from what other manufacturers may be saying. Beam efficiency is a ratio of the energy in the main lobe to the total energy an antenna radiates, making it a perfect and complete measure of side lobes. So how is beam efficiency obtained? Beam efficiency of an antenna can be determined through a measurement in an anechoic chamber like the one in the image. The antenna is attached to a rotary stage which rotates it in two axes and it can measure the radiation pattern of an antenna, the full 3D radiation pattern. And based on the measurement, uh, we can calculate the beam efficiency. Alternatively, if the model of an antenna is precise, 
or let's say an antenna is, is simple enough, we can use simulation software to do the same thing, obtaining the radiation pattern, and based on that, we can calculate beam efficiency. So, if beam efficiency is 40%, this amounts to the power that goes into the main lobe. So the remaining 60% must therefore be in the side lobes. No question there. And note that all the side lobes are highlighted. Yeah? So beam efficiency really uh, includes all the side lobes of an antenna, not just one or a slice of the radiation pattern, but the whole package, yeah? the full 3D data, making, which is why what makes beam efficiency a complete measure of side lobes. Everything is included. And you can calculate beam efficiency for any antenna out there. Uh, here you see the radiation pattern of a typical sector antenna. If beam efficiency is 58%, the rest of the energy, meaning the 42%, must be in the side lobes. This clearly tells you why the patch array sector antennas are really not so good for unlicensed WISP networks for the most part. 42% of the signal they radiate and receive is noise. Now, WISPs use quite a wide chunk of the spectrum, but in antenna textbooks, beam efficiency is defined at a single frequency and for a single polarization. Now, this is the case for most textbook parameters, actually, and it makes perfect sense to always consider any antenna parameter in the whole useful bandwidth antenna works and not just the single frequency point. And since WISPs use their antennas in a wide frequency band, it only makes perfect sense that an antenna should perform well in the whole bandwidth in all important aspects, including beam efficiency. Which is why we decided to actually average beam efficiency over the whole useful bandwidth, and on top of that for both polarizations. And the effect of this averaging is that it turns this you know, textbook beam efficiency definition in a much more robust and reliable measure of the silo performance than the single frequency and single polarization definition or anything else out there, really. Vast majority of antennas used for sector coverage in with networks are, are either patch arrays or horns. And the patch arrays have many frequency dependent side lobes. So their beam efficiency values are somewhere on the on the on the scale of 60%, depending on the manufacturing and the design quality. The RF element horns, both symmetrical and asymmetrical, have beam efficiency between 90 and 95%. Now you can see other horns in, in this comparison as well. And this is to help you understand that it makes it takes a considerable effort to design a horn antenna such that its beam efficiency is high. The stable and zero side lobe uh, performance is not a given as soon as you have a horn, so be careful with that. But we do put a lot of effort into design of our antennas. Likewise with the point-to-point -point antennas. The patch arrays are again at the bottom of the beam efficiency performance due to the many frequency dependent side lobes collecting and transmitting the noise hurting any and every WISP network out there. And dishes are somewhat better. And generally the bigger the dish, the better the beam efficiency becomes if the antenna is carefully designed and well manufactured on top of that. Now with any antenna though, the Compromises accepted at the design stage unfortunately cannot be compensated by manufacturing quality since the real-world results are at best approaching the results which we get from the simulation. What is interesting here though is the ultra horn. Its beam efficiency is 99%. Now let that sink in for a second. Over the whole bandwidth of operation in both polarizations, the beam efficiency of ultrahorn is practically perfect. Only 1% of the RF signal goes into side lobe. So if you ever wonder if ultrahorn was worth the extra cash compared to a dish with similar gain, you have a very clear answer here. With 99% beam efficiency, it is the best performing antenna on the market in terms of noise suppression. And the good thing is you can use ultrahorn not only for point-to-point -point, but also for point-to-multipoint coverage yeah, and, and with the 
with the option of tilting the antenna down, you can actually uh, dynamically adjust the coverage. Yeah, so it's really a very versatile tool, and and the best tool in terms of noise suppression. Beam efficiency tells you everything about side low performance. The higher the beam efficiency is, the better an antenna performs. Period. So forget about front of ratio, side lobe level, or Etsy masks, and really focus on beam efficiency of an antenna with, when dealing with noise. Not only is the most it's the most complete measure of side lobes, but it's also extremely robust measure of side lobes because of the averaging over the frequency, band, and both polarizations. And a word of caution here: the average beam efficiency is our own internal standard. RF element standard we set up for ourselves. Yeah, so if anyone is telling you their antenna has high beam efficiency as well, ask them if it's averaged over the whole useful bandwidth and both polarizations to make sure the comparison is fair. Since it rarely happens that a wireless link is situated in a completely isolated place, the interference is present practically everywhere. The noisier the environment, the more important beam efficiency of an antenna you use becomes. Because the higher the beam efficiency, the better noise isolation. And recently you can also hear claims from other antenna manufacturers saying, for example, well, this sector patcher antenna works like horn in terms of avoiding the noise or similar statements. And to these claims, I would just ask a single question. What is the average beam efficiency of that antenna? Now, if the beam efficiency of that antenna is of similar values, then I would stay quiet and say, yes, I agree. But otherwise, if the beam efficiency is anything below 90%, you can be sure that they're really not the same and the claims of the manufacturers are, are probably more of a marketing fluff than anything else. And in the following section, I will tell you about the practical implications and consequences of using an antenna with high beam efficiency. And we can sum up the effect of high beam efficiency antennas into one statement, higher throughput. So, in a sector with no other links in the area, you don't mind the side lobes, but as the number of sectors grows, their, their side lobes cause the noise floor to rise. And higher noise floor equals lower SNR the radios are working with and eventually lower throughput. The beam efficiency of patch array sectors is on the order of 60%, as we saw. So the remaining 40% of the energy is in the side lobes that collect and transmit interference to, to other links within yours, but also competitors' networks, obviously. So low beam efficiency equals lower throughput and consequentially more unsatisfied customers and constant issues with your network and that you know keeps you unnecessarily busy. Low beam efficiency of dish antennas works in a very similar way. Yeah, it's, it's really the same thing, uh, but not different, really. <laughs> the side lobes collect the noise from its surroundings and, and transmit it to all neighboring links again. So whether it's a backhaul link or a distant narrow sector, the beam efficiency around 40% means low throughput in high noise areas. And on top of that, susceptibility you know, of these links to, to any, anything that's happening in the surroundings. Like if someone puts up a new link, you instantly, instantly see uh, the result on, on your network performance. Now, replacing the, the low beam efficiency patch array sector by horn antennas with, with beam efficiency up to 99%. The noise level in the urban and high density areas is effectively avoided. Yeah? Because high beam efficiency means no side lobes, and no side lobes means no interference. The final effect is high throughput and network stability. Addressing the most pressing problem of WISP networks is much more straightforward. Now, only one advice here you know, use antennas with high beam efficiency. High beam efficiency equals to high throughput, and that equals eventually to happy customers of, of your WISP and a joyful life as an internet service provider. Yeah? And it actually frees you, it gives you the freedom and time to, uh, you know, 
you can switch from running around servicing uh, the, the faulty and problematic links or, or talking to angry customers to actually start thinking about, well, how can I expand my business? How can I do even better? Yeah. And that's, that's really something that, uh, that's invaluable. And the radio manufacturers are, are actually also trying to help with the noise naturally. So the GPS synchronization uh, ensuring that the, the radios in your network uh, transmit and receive at the same time protects you from self-interference, but not from the side lobes of the competitors' antennas. Now, high beam efficiency ensures that you do not have to worry about the interference at all. It does not receive it. Yeah? So you don't need to try to deal with it in the first place. So beam efficiency is a very practical antenna parameter. Now, where before the discussion about the side lobes was limited to many versus little or yes versus no, beam efficiency provides a number from 0 to 100% and it's super easy to compare side lobe performance of antenna. So now you know uh, that front of ratio or side lobe level are parameters that are really not so important. Now are use not even not not useful yeah in WISP industry because they only consider one side lobe or one lobe out of many an antenna might have. So beam efficiency on the other hand includes all the side lobes, which makes it very useful metric. Including all the side lobes removes any ambiguity. You can be sure that this metric is reliable. Always ask whether a parameter is a single frequency or wideband. Yeah, in WISP industry, wideband is simply a must because the spectrum is shared by many and therefore wide band performance is vital. An RF element addition to the beam efficiency definition is to, is to average, uh, average it over both polarizations and the whole antenna bandwidth. So you cannot do better than that. It's really the most one can do in terms of um, how well uh, or how useful this parameter can be. So beam efficiency is the ultimate measure to judge antennas by in WISP industry. And it is a tool in your hands, eventually, to make better decisions for, for your business. So please use it and asking for it, uh, ask for it, you know, if, if an antenna you're, you're looking for doesn't have it in the data sheet. To make it easy for uh, our customers, we added beam efficiency of our antennas into all our data sheets. And we are a transparent manufacturer and want to provide our customers the information that's important. And if by any chance you need to explain to someone very quickly what beam efficiency is and why it matters, feel free to direct them to our Inside Wireless video series on our YouTube channel. Yeah, it's these two particular episodes that do a fantastic job explaining beam efficiency within minutes. And another uh, YouTube uh, playlist we have is called uh, Wisp Traveler, yeah, where we went to different places around the world, as you can see, and interviewed our customers, asking them what was their experience with our antennas. So if you don't take it from us, that our antennas are great, which is natural, of course, you you know, you have to check or you have to first test it out or maybe lean on the experience of your peers, and which is why we recorded these videos. And be assured, these are not staged videos. You can actually even contact these people personally and, and find out for yourself. We also have an online community. So we're definitely very active on Facebook, on, on the many WISP-related forums. And we also have our RF Elements English page and RF Elements Africa, RF Elements Espanol. And what else? I think that was... And Asia. Yeah, we also have RF Elements Asia, which are the support groups where you can actually contact our salesmen or salesmen, uh, ask them about the availability or anything related to our products or ask a technical question. Yeah, anything goes really. And we also have rfilab.com, which is our which is our user forum. Yeah, again, a lot of questions have been asked already. So you can search through those or 
simply um, add your own question you know, if you have something specific something pressing that's um, that you need to answer so it's probably time to wrap up this webinar it was a pleasure to have you have you here and i'm looking forward to any other webinars you might be joining so have a good day and bye bye